In early February 1961, two Italian radio operators, the Giudica Cordelia brothers, reportedly received an extraordinary transmission. The brothers had spent the previous year holed up in a makeshift listening station in an old German bunker with their equipment pointed towards the stars, hoping to listen in on the early space expeditions being mounted by both the United States and Soviet Union at the time. The incoming broadcasts of February 1961 were unusual, though, and featured muffled, gasping noises and what sounded like a human being struggling to breathe. Another signal, a faint pulse, was also heard shortly after. The brothers played the recordings for their father, a cardiologist, who believed the soft pulse was a failing human heartbeat. If that were true, it would mean that someone, the Soviets or the Americans, had successfully launched a man into space for the first time, and that the brave pioneer likely never returned alive. The brothers' recordings quickly became the stuff of lore, and were shared across Italy and broadcast far and wide. Yet no official announcement was made in the coming weeks from any government or space program, and surely if a man had been successfully sent into space, someone would have come forward to claim credit. This radio silence seemed to embody a Soviet space program that operated and thrived in darkness. Space and radio enthusiasts in the 1950s and early 1960s had been left to guess as to just how close the Russians were to launching a human being into orbit. It was only a combination of hearsay, leaks, and home recordings, like the ones captured by the Judica Cordelia brothers, that eventually cast occasional light on the program and hinted at the darker secrets it may be hiding. For as much as we all know the name and story of Yuri Gagarin, the Soviet pilot who successfully became the first human to journey to space in his Vostok 1 spacecraft on April 12, 1961, evidence at the time also suggested that there may have been other, earlier, manned missions into space. If true, it means that the extremely PR-sensitive Soviet government intentionally swept a number of failures and disasters under the rug until they had a success they could champion to the world. Indeed, there may have been a whole class of Russian cosmonauts lost to space and time that the world has never fully known. The Lost Cosmonauts Theory refers to a group of Russian pilots that may have been lost on impact or abandoned in space on unsuccessful missions. This idea suggests a secretive Russian government may have buried all evidence of these disastrous missions. As the Cold War raged on into the 60s, the use of propaganda increased on both sides, but because the Russians had the advantage of a state-controlled media, they were able to be much more selective of the news that left its borders and the way it was presented to the outside world. This, coupled with a fever pitch of anticipation across the globe over the prospect of human spaceflight, created a demand for information and a tendency to speculate. From the US side, a disposition to view the Soviet government as suspicious and untrustworthy led many Americans to wonder and imagine both of their successes and their failures in the space race. Perhaps the earliest source to fan the flame to the lost cosmonaut theory came forward in December 1959, when a high-ranking Czech communist leaked information that multiple cosmonauts had perished in unofficial early missions to space. Four names were mentioned by the source, and later published by the Italian news agency Continentale. Alexei Lidovsky, Serenti Shkiborin, Andrei Mitkov, and Maria Gromov. But beyond the names, no other details were ever corroborated or confirmed. Earlier that same year, an issue of the Russian weekly magazine Oganyak published the names of three high-altitude parachutists who had allegedly been involved in the experiment of the Soviet space program, Colonel Pyotr Dalkov, Ivan Kachur, and Alexei Grachov. Official records later confirmed that Dolgov was lost, but not in a mission to space. Rather, Dolgov had been conducting a test parachute jump from a Volga balloon gondola when his helmet's visor smashed against the side of the gondola and depressurized his suit. Kachor and Grachov, however, seemingly disappeared from records during the same period, fueling speculation that they had been lost in space. A final early source before the infamous Judica Cordelia recordings was documented on May 15, 1960, when the American science fiction writer Robert Heinlein was traveling through Lithuania. He later confirmed, in an article titled Pravda Means Truth, published in Expanded Universes magazine, that he overheard Red Army soldiers talking about how the Soviet Union had sent a man into orbit that day. These rumors were quashed by higher-up Soviet officials, but Heinlein was unconvinced, and speculated that the Soviet program to put a man into space was much further along and taking far greater risks than openly acknowledged. It was around the same time, in May of 1960, 
that the Judica Cordelia brothers made their first recording of what they believed was a manned spaceflight. By this point, Torre Bear, their makeshift studio outside of Turin, was well stocked with salvaged and improvised radio equipment, and their operation was up and running. They claimed to have already been tracking both Sputnik and Explorer 1, the Soviet and American satellite programs of the late 1950s, by using telemetry and visual data to calculate trajectory and know where to aim their equipment. It was on November 28, 1960, that the brothers made what was one of their first and most compelling recordings, the sound of an SOS Morse code signal slowly fading. The brothers believed, because they could not detect any Doppler effect from the signal, that it was a capsule moving directly away from the Earth, the sound of a hopeless spacecraft drifting away from orbit. Just over two months later, in February of the next year, they released their infamous recording of the gasping breath and the fading heartbeat. Two months after that, in April 1961, they claimed to have documented a space capsule orbiting the Earth three times and then re-entering the atmosphere, days before Yuri Gagarin's April 12th expedition, in which he only orbited the Earth once. Later, Torre Bar recordings taken between 1961 through 1963 even featured human voices, with perhaps the most dramatic of which occurring just a month later, in May 1961. A muffled female voice speaks in Russian, audibly distressed. Translated into English, the transcription reads, quote, Isn't this dangerous? Talk to me. Our transmission begins now. I feel hot. I can see a flame. Am I going to crash? Yes, I feel hot. I will re-enter. The audio, if it is to be believed, is bone-chilling to hear, the sound of a pioneer giving in to the terror and hopelessness of the moment. The brothers' tapes were never corroborated at the time, though, and it was only with the fall of the Soviet Union that some of the material in history kept secret by the Soviet space program ultimately came to see the light of day. While some of what the brothers picked up at the Torre Bar Tower over those years appeared to be credible, there was little evidence to be found in the old Soviet files. And when viewed in hindsight, even more has come out against their more remarkable recordings, and with it, leading to greater skepticism. New information gleaned in the decades since does seem to cloud the veracity of the Judica Cordelia brothers' work in the early 60s. For instance, if the brothers did in fact pick up the authentic sound of breathing and a heartbeat over their equipment, those sounds very likely belonged to one of the many dogs used by the Soviets as test subjects, and not a human being. The SOS recording of a signal drifting out into deep space were deemed by many in the scientific community to be impossible, as the Soviets had not invented a rocket with the capacity to leave Earth's orbit until 1969. Much was also made over the years of the April 1961 recording of a craft orbiting the Earth three times, the one that occurred mere days before Yuri Gagarin's much more famous launch. The theories that arose often involved a complex story about the mission's pilot, Vladimir Ilyushin, experiencing an equipment malfunction that caused a premature re-entry and crash landing in the People's Republic of China. Ilyushin was then allegedly captured and held hostage by the Chinese for the next year before being returned to the USSR. As in so many of these cases, much of the incentive to cover such an incident up is chalked up to the sense of pride of the Soviet government and their distaste for embarrassment or shame. A subsequent investigation by British journalist Dennis Ogden, though, revealed a much more likely theory, in which Ilyushin was simply a test pilot and never involved in the space program, and stayed willingly in China for a year to undergo medical procedures after a serious crash injured both his legs. This explanation has its issues, too, and it still does not fully explain the need for such a cover-up. But tellingly, it would have been extremely difficult for the space program to launch two manned missions into orbit within a week of each other which is what anyone who believes Ilyushin went to space must buy into. For his part, Ilyushin himself died in 2010, without confirming his story one way or the other. The cosmonaut voice recordings remain suspect as well. Apparently, none of the voices captured followed proper protocol in using codes or using the right terminology for their equipment. The recording of the female voice made in May of 1961 created a stir, but once the transmission was translated by someone fluent in Russian, it was questioned whether the voice was even actually Russian at all. Much of the vocabulary used was noted as slightly off, stiff, not the dialect of a natural speaker. To cast more doubt on the authenticity, it seemed the brother's sister had been learning Russian, ostensibly to help with the brother's own translation. And finally, the strongest piece of evidence against the brother's recordings and the lost cosmonaut theory may simply be this. 
We know now that people, governments, and private interests all over the world were also attempting to listen in to the early space race test missions. Many parties had much more advanced equipment than the brothers. If some of the events the brothers claimed to document on tape actually occurred, wouldn't someone else have had their equipment turned on and recorded it too? Ultimately, there may be less to the lost cosmonaut theory than when the rumor first emerged. But unanswered questions still remain, a leading one being this. Beyond national pride, what possible reasons did Russia have for keeping all this information classified as long as they did? Yes, some pilots were lost in the testing phase and to early missions gone awry, but accidents happen, and did happen in the US space program as well. What good could possibly come from redacting information that did not require it? That being said, many details about the Soviet space program remain purposefully obscured. Beyond Sputnik, we don't even know the basic size and shape of most Soviet space equipment, let alone have details about mission successes and failures. It seems the truth may be lost in orbit, while we, here, back on Earth, remain in the dark.